when Content Marketing World asked me, or Content Marketing Institute asked me what I wanted to speak on, I said, I'd like to talk about why you don't need more content. And they said, sounds great. And I was like, really? <laughs> this is Content Marketing World, right? But they were like, yeah, go for it. So it doesn't mean you don't need content. It just means you don't need all the content. So that's what we're going to talk about. In the next 45 minutes, we are going to cover how to close as many clients as you need to hit your goals. We talk a lot about how hope is not a strategy. Um, and you know, a lot of us tend to say, okay, January's here, we're gonna do $10 million this year, up from a million, and we have no idea how we're gonna do it. So, <laughs> you're laughing, because it's true, right? <laughs> I mean, it's a gross exaggeration, but it's kind of true. So we will talk about how many, close, to, to close how many clients you need, um, how to fill your pipeline with qualified referrals, not the, you know, the, the tire kickers or the people that sit with you for an hour over coffee or lunch or drinks and say, I need this, 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 and this, and then you go back to the office and write a proposal, and you put in there everything that they asked for, and it's $150,000, dollars $300,000, and you never hear from them again. <laughs> right? We've all had this pain, all of us. <clears throat> um, we'll talk about how to create additional revenue streams. This is a lesson I learned after the recession bombed, and we're coming up on another one. So really think about, and we'll talk about, how you create additional revenue streams that are not just uh, fee-for-service, the other kinds of things that you can do there. We'll talk about how to attract only the right clients, so not the, the tire kickers. How to get off that hamster wheel of taking two steps forward and five steps back. You know, okay, okay, we won this big client and now we're gonna get all ramped up and then we lost a client. And then we won another client, we're gonna get all ramped up and then we, this something happened over here. So we'll talk about how that. We'll get over the what have you done for me lately mentality. And I'll just tell you a quick story. In uh, 2007, we worked with a very large organization and we, I mean, traditionally I'm a, P a PR person. We were kicking butt on media relations. I mean, just killing it. They were on the front page of the LA Times. They were on the front page of the Wall Street Journal right below the fold, which just does not happen. And after that, this, so this is 2007, so it was before you know Chris Penn was here telling me how to collect my data and analytics and, and use it. We were hitting refresh on the analytics to see the website traffic go up coming from the Wall Street Journal. I mean, it was just a huge coup for them. The next day, I got a package in the <laughs> A FedEx package from the CEO of the business and the New York Times was in it and there was a stick a post-it note on the front that said when is when is the New York Times next and I was like oh. so really we at, at that point was I was like I've got to figure out how to get out of this mentality of the Wall Street Journal was great but that was yesterday when are we getting in the New York Times and then how to turn your expertise into a five-figure monthly income. So not just your services, that's going to be separate, but how you take what's in your brain and the kinds of things that you're doing for clients and, for lack of a better term, productize it. All right. How many of you rely pretty much on referrals and word of mouth? For those of you who don't rely on it, what else are you doing for biz dev? Advertising, speaking, uh, remarketing, retargeting. Advertising, speaking, remarketing, retargeting. Cold pitching. Cold pitching? Wow. You're bold. <laughs> yeah, networking, speaking. Networking, speaking, and cold pitching. Wow. Anybody else doing cold pitching? Does it work? Yeah. yeah. Works nice. Well. Awesome. I have to talk to you guys about this. <laughs> right. <laughs> we have to talk about this. <laughs> um, how many of you are constantly over servicing clients? <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> yeah. Um, what about not getting paid for all the time you spend? Yep, pretty much everyone. Uh, dealing daily with out of scope requests, emergencies. I have a friend who was driving here from Chicago yesterday and he stopped in Toledo because there was a client emergency. And he was supposed to be here by 4, 4 or 4.30 yesterday. He arrived at like 8 <laughs> because he was dealing with an emergency. Um, how many of you have created a job versus a su sustainable business? Do you have sustainable businesses, something that could live without you? Could you take a month off and it would be okay? <laughs> That's the best response ever. 
That's a no. <laughs> we'll talk about that. Um, and this is probably not so much for this, this group because t most of you probably are pretty technologically savvy. But for a lot of people we work with, technology is moving just too fast for them to keep up. They just can't keep up with it. How many of you spend all of your time working in the business versus on it? <laughs> How many of you actually set time aside every week to do things like marketing and business development for your agency? Good. That's about half of you. That's great. That's actually not normal. Um, I, I told this story, Tim Washer and I just did the uh, Content Marketing World Chatter and I told this story, but I read an article about Bill Gates a few years ago and it talked about how he would go into the mountains or into the woods in his, and go to his cabin by himself, no technology, no Wi-Fi, no internet, nothing, take his orange crush with him, which apparently he loves, and that's all, that tidbit has always stuck with me, and he sp would spend a week just working on the business. And he would think about plans, he would think about vision, he would think about culture, he would think about all those kinds of things. And that's always stuck with me because it's one of the things that we should all be doing. Now we not, might not all have the luxury of being able to take a week off and go into the woods and, and do this with our orange, I would take wine, but you know, <coughs> not orange crush. Um, <laughs> you and I are friends. <laughs> okay, awesome. <laughs> we'll just have a group and we'll all go. Um, but it's always stuck with me, and I remember at the time, and this was years ago, I thought, okay, I'm going to spend a half a day every week working on the business. Well, silly me cho chose Friday afternoon. <laughs> it's a really bad idea. I was like, oh, I have the, the afternoon to work on the business. I'm going to go ride my bike. <laughs> or, oh, I have the afternoon off. I'm going to go watch some Netflix. You know, like, you, t Friday afternoon is bad. So choose a different, I, by that point I was like, okay, this is a bad idea. So I chose Tuesday afternoon. And then it started to expand from there. And now I am to the point where it's one week a month that I work on the business. I don't take any meetings. I don't work with, I mean, I, I don't do my one-to-one -one meetings with my team. I don't do anything except work on the business, the vision, the culture, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> so there are some things that you need to be thinking about as you try to figure out, A, how to grow your agency without relying on hope, without relying on referrals and word of mouth, uh, by being able to get off the hamster wheel. And it's things like, the, the, these kinds of things will help you start getting qualified leads. It'll help you attract the right clients who have budgets to spend. It will help you have complete control over who you work with. Not just who wants to work with you, but who you decide you want to work with. You'll be paid for the value you provide not for the time that you're spending, you'll stop over servicing, and you'll make money while, you're, while you sleep. A few years ago, I was skiing in Colorado with a girlfriend of mine, and we were on the lift, and she pulls her phone out, and she goes, huh, I just, I just made 2000 bless you, I just made $2,000. And I was like, what? What do you mean? We're on the lift going up the, to, to ski. And she's like, yeah, you know, I set up this thing on the internet, where they can pay, they can schedule a call, and then they can pay for it. And, and she's walking me through this whole, whole thing, and I was like, I need that. I need to figure out how somebody can go onto my website, schedule a coaching call, pay for it while I'm skiing. Freaking amazing, right? I'm going to show you how. So my promise to you today is that we're going to have a step-by-step -step strategy to help you scale your agency with one piece of content. Not all the content, not everything you have you should think you should be doing, one piece of content. <clears throat> the first thing I want you to do is forget about brand cachet. And I think this is one thing that's really hard for us to do because we think, okay, well, as soon as everybody knows about us, well, of course, you know, they're going to hire the, the Fleischmann Hillards or the Leo Burnett's of the world because everybody knows who they are. That doesn't mean that they're doing the right things or doing or even servicing the right kinds of clients. Firms with brand cachet actually grow less than 1% every year. Would you find it incredibly frustrating if you grew less than 1% every year? I wouldn't stay in business. I'd be like, this is dumb. I can't do this. So I want you to think about it from that perspective. Your agency is what propels Main Street, not the big brand name ad agencies and PR firms and digital agencies. Your agency 
is what's propelling the business, the economy forward. Clients don't care if you have brand cachet if you can solve their problems. And that's where you want to focus is the problems that you're solving and the value you provide. And I think so many of us get caught up in, well, nobody knows who we are. And well, it only took me two hours, so that should only be like $800. But it provides massive value to the client. Can I tell your, I'm going to tell a story. I'm not asking for permission. Last night, Chris and I were talking, and he said, we're working on this thing that's going to solve massive problem for a client that's losing a lot of money, like hundreds of thousands of dollars every month. And we're charging $18,000 for it, but you know, it only took a couple of hours. And Mitch Joel said to him, it doesn't matter that it only took you a couple of hours because it's taken 20 years of you honing this expertise. So they're paying for the 20 years of expertise, not the two hours that it took you to complete the work. And then we talked him into charging more than $18,000, <laughs> right? <laughs> the problem is, is that we gather evidence to support our thinking. And for most of us, the industry requires that we meet with a prospect, we write a proposal, we send the proposal, we give them all sorts of great thinking, and then we either hear from them or we don't. And because that's the way things are done, that's what we do. So we've gathered the evidence to support that kind of thinking. That's what everybody does. That doesn't mean that's the right way to do it. And then what happens is we start to get comfortable when we begin to rely on referrals and word of mouth. I grew my agency through referrals and word of mouth. Most of you have grown your agencies through referrals and word of mouth. I think there are only like two of you that did not raise your hand. So we get really comfortable and it's great when it works and when the economy is booming and there's lots of business to go around, it really sucks when the, con the economy crashes. How many of you lived through the last recession? <sighs> Did you enjoy it? So painful. I said to myself, I never want to go through that again. And here we are. We're going to be out to go. Actually, Chris and I were just talking about this last night, too. We think it's coming in the fourth quarter. We're about to go through it again. So. We have to, have to, have to find ways to stop relying on referrals and word of mouth, to stop sending proposals with all of our great ideas, and actually build a plan that helps us with business development. The problem, of course, is that selling is a bad word. And so this is one of the things I say to our clients all the time. You're not selling. You're building relationships. This is what we do. We're building relationships with just somebody new. So, Instead of thinking about it as, oh, I got to close this prospect, I got to sell them on this, and I got to do this, you are having a conversation. And one of the things I like to relate it to is sort of the doctor diagnosis. You don't go into the doctor and you say, I have a headache, I've had a headache for six days, it's probably migraine level, I'm pretty sure I have a brain tumor, can you operate? <laughs> you don't do that, right? But every prospect on earth comes to us, every prospect, and says, our sales are down, nobody knows who we are, our competitor's kicking our butt, there was just this big roundup that didn't include us, so I need you to do this, 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 and this. Maybe, maybe you have a brain tumor, maybe not. But we actually have to diagnose the problem first. So I want you to sort of change that mindset of you're not selling, you're building relationships and you're diagnosing a problem. And when you do that, it doesn't feel so, so dirty. It's not such a bad word. So think about that from the perspective of just forget about brand cachet and start to prove what kind of outcome you provide and that's what will do the quote unquote selling for you. So let me give you a quick, quick case study. Um, <clears throat> Spin Sucks is my second business. I have a PR firm and we launched a blog, gosh, in 2006 and at the time it was called The Fight Against Destructive Spin. Turns out spinsucks.com was available. And I had an intern who we were sitting in the conference room and he said, you know, you really hate it when people call you a spin doctor. What if we did spin sucks? And I was like, great, awesome, love that idea. It was available, we picked it up, and we've evolved from fight against destructive spin to spin sucks. Um, it started as a blog, then it afforded me a couple of books, it's afforded me some speaking opportunities and all that, and now it's become an actual business with its own P&L and its own team and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we didn't have brand cachet. Like I started blogging and 
I just talked about the things that really bother me about the PR industry. The kinds of things like people calling you a spin doctor. You're sitting on, I would sit on a plane and you know, talk to somebody next to me and they would say, what do you do for a living? Oh, I do PR. Oh, you lie for a living. No, I don't lie for a living. Sure, there are some people who do, but that's not what we do. And so I would sort of get on my soapbox and blog about this. And no, I will admit that the timing was really right, you know, because blogging was just coming to the forefront and all that kind of stuff. And it, and the economy had crashed, so we all had a little extra time to connect on Twitter and, you know, sort of hang out and comment on other people's blogs. We had the time to do that. We don't anymore. Um, but we didn't have brand cachet. We had none of that. All we did is see a need for something in an industry and start to plan toward it. There were so many failures, so many failures. In 2011, <laughs> this is so embarrassing to tell these the stories these days, but in 2011, we had, we were to the point where we were like, okay, online courses are coming. This is how people are going to learn. Not everybody's gonna be able to go to events anymore. This is where things are going but nothing like a learning management system existed back then. And so we built one from scratch. It cost $150,000. <coughs> um, and it bombed. It completely bombed, completely. Now, we've relaunched it since then, and it has not bombed. But back then, completely bombed. We had no brand cachet, lots and lots of failures. And then we did a pilot program where we made $239,000. And I was like, Okay, <laughs> we have something here. So you have to keep going at it, keep going at it, keep going at it, so that you can build a foundation for something that you really want to do. But there has to be a plan and there has to be a process. So for your action item for this specific one on forgetting about brand cachet, uh, figure out what your best business driver is. So if it is, maybe you have a two day strategy session. Maybe you have an online course. Maybe there's an ebook or a webinar series. What is it that's driving, that's not necessarily driving the most revenue or most business from a revenue standpoint right now, but something that A, you want to focus on, and B, drives your passion? Because that's where you will be able to find the most revenue generation from those kinds of things. So craft a plan, work on it, go and spend a week in the woods with your orange crush, Craft your plan and then focus on that. That's your first action item. Then I want you to start thinking about additional revenue streams. And additional revenue streams could very well be online courses. It could be webinar series. It could be, uh, we actually do a two day strategy session that we charge a lot, a lot of money for. And then that propels us into a uh, retainer program with a client. Um, it could be something like that. It could be books, it could be speaking, but whatever it is that you want to do, really start to think about what additional revenue streams do I want to add? And it may evolve, but what right now, what, not right this second, but during this conference or when you get back to the office, I would like you to write down seven ways that you can build additional revenue that isn't reliant just on you serving the client. You will have that, and, I, and then you put dates against it. So in 2020, we're gonna do this one, and only do one a year. One a year is plenty. 2021, 2022, and by you know, seven years from now, 2027, let's call it, you'll have seven additional revenue streams. And it very well could be, you know, I mean, I have books, I do speaking, I have the online courses. There's a lot of different revenue streams that you could have. Maybe it's a podcast with advertising sponsors. There are lots of things that you can do. So think about what those, those seven additional revenue streams are. Um, so as we were <laughs> thinking about this $239,000 launch, one of the things that we did is we emailed our list, and this only works if you have a list, and we said, if you could spend an hour with, with us to talk about business, what would you like to talk about? And we got everything from, we drink wine and eat cupcakes, people know me well. Um, and then we got real, like real responses. And so then we took that and we did the 80-20 rule. And what we did is we said, okay, for we, if you actually put a, a really thoughtful response and we did it by character count, so if somebody wrote a lot, they had a, you know, a thousand characters, 
then they got moved to the top. If somebody just said, well, drink wine and cupcake, eat cupcakes, they got moved to the bottom. And then we took that and we put it into buckets to help us determine where people had the most need. And that's the first course we launched. Because that helped us determine what it was that they wanted. I was at this very conference five years ago, and I was at a dinner with some of the biggest names in, in content marketing, and they were talking about, oh, this online craze, it's baloney, nobody makes any money at it, it's this internet marketing hack, and you know, one person said, you know, I spent $100,000 to create this online course, and it's beautifully pr produced, and we emailed my list and nobody bought. And I'm just listening to this whole thing. And somebody else said, yeah, we did it too, and I think we had two people buy. All this money spent, and I mean, to be fair, I had that same experience in 2011, but this was later, many years later. Um, and I just sat there and I was listening to it and listening to it, and finally Andy Cristadina, who's sitting next to me, goes, so Ginny, what's your experience been? <laughs> and I was like, well, we made $239,000. And every, I mean, like, mic drop. Everybody just turned and looked at me. And it's because we asked. We asked people what they wanted. We didn't just create a course and, and build it and put it out there for everybody. We actually asked. And that's one of the things you want to think about. So you, you think about asking your prospects, asking your clients. Say to your clients, hey, if we were to build something to teach your team how to do what we do, what's the most important thing to you? It might be SEO. It might be media relations. It might be media training. It might be crisis communication. It could very well be social media 101. Ask them, because that's the kind of stuff that's going to give you the market research to be able to build something that's of value to them. That's my dog, Jack Bauer. <laughs> um, and this allows you to sell the result that you provide and, and the value that you provide instead of the time that you're spent. It also reassures clients that you're the best among the best. So even though you don't have brand cachet, even though you're not the Leo Burnett or the Fleischmann Hillers or the Edelmans of the world, you know what you're talking about and you can provide results. There's more skin in the game on, from their perspective and this is far, far easier to scale, completely easier to scale because now you have something that you can replicate over and over again, where on the services side of things, you have to have more people to replicate that, right? To scale it. And more people are expensive, it's harder to scale. Is Tony still here? Oh, he was here. Um, okay, so I wanna tell you a story about Tony now. He's, he runs T60 Productions, a video storytelling company in Chicago. Um, and he was trying to figure this whole piece out, like how do I create additional revenue streams that allow me to scale without adding more people? And so he created a three-part storytelling process. And now if you go to his website, you can buy one of his stories. So it's a corporate video, it's an about us video, and there's one other, I can't remember. Um, but you can buy that, and it's really inexpensive for him to produce because what he's done is he's built a network of producers. So now it doesn't require him to get on a plane, expensive, take his time, expensive, and go and shoot the video. Now he can call somebody at the WGN affiliate in Tallahassee and say, hey, I have a client there. This is what they need. This is our process. This is what I want you to ask. Send it back over. We'll edit it and be done with it. And he's, it's all online. You can buy it right there on his website and put in your information, pay for it, and be done with it. 80% profit he has created with this. 80% profit. Because the only expense he has is in the freelance videographer or producer that he's found in whatever city. 80% profit. And what he and his family are doing now is because of this, he li they like to travel. They have a third grader who they like to have out in the, the world. And so they do lots of house swapping. So they'll say to the producer in Tallahassee or Jacksonville or wherever it happens to be, um, hey, you ever wanted to live in, in Chicago or Milwaukee? I'd love for you to come and house swap with me. So they come and live in his house for a month and they go live in their house for a month. And so they, he's created this really cool lifestyle piece to it too, not just the business side of things. So your action item for this, if you have not read Built to Sell, read Built to Sell. It's an easy read. 
and it's not a business book that you're like, oh, I have to read a business book. It's really easy to read. It takes the, a look at an ad agency owner and follows him through the process of, oh my gosh, I just went to a client, I showed the ads, he wants this red instead of this red, and the, I mean, you all know this, you will see yourself in the story for sure. And, and how he took his expertise and productized it. I don't even know if that's a real word, but he created a product out of his, his expertise, his intellectual property. It completely changed the way I think about what we do, completely changed it. So I highly, highly, highly recommend it. You could probably read it on the, on the flight home, unless you live here, in which case, get your hiking boots and go for a walk. <laughs> Um, but really, what I want you to do as you read it, not only will you see yourself, yourselves in it, but really think about how do I take our expertise, our intellectual property, and create a product around it. An online course, an ebook, a webinar series, a speaking series, you know, whatever it happens to be, how can you create what's in your brain into a product? And like I mentioned earlier, ask people what they want. If you have a list, beautiful, use it. Send an email. You guys just did this a week or so ago. We do it every quarter on your advice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so they send an email and say, I think it was, what's the, what's the biggest challenge you're facing for fourth quarter? And they're getting all sorts of great answers and it has been bucketed into five buckets where they can now go, okay, we know that the economy is stressing people out. We know that return on investment is stressing people out. We know that just like getting started people don't know from a data and analytics perspective. So now they can create products around that to help. They can create screen share webinars to help, right? So think about it from your perspective and ask people what they want. We have a client who was trying to figure this out and all of their clients, every single one of their clients, 100% of their clients said, the biggest value you have provided to us is media training. That's the biggest value and I went, so what should you do some product, some online courses on? And they went, media training? <laughs> yes. So really think about it. What can you do to create those additional revenue streams and build your value outside of doing the work for clients? Now, I'm not saying you should get rid of that. You absolutely should still have that, but in addition to. Stop relying on referrals and word of mouth. So many of us give our expertise away for free. This has to stop. And the only way that the way, and, and I know that this is how things are done, I know that. The only way to change it is if we all do it. And this is a very typical story. We, I mentioned this earlier, we meet with a prospect, they say we want this, 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 and this. We go back, we create this beautiful deck with all these ideas. If you're a creative person, maybe you've added some creative thinking and you know, we're, maybe we could do some of these ads or whatever it happens to be. We've given away all this, this information for free. Why do we do that? We don't have to do that. And it's not because it's what they expect, because you're in control of that conversation. If you say in a conversation, we'd love to work with you, this is our process. We have a two-day strategy session. In that session, you get this, 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 and this, and this. Here's who we, we require be in that meeting, C-level, marketing, blah, 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 blah. At the end, the deliverable is this and you talk them through it. That sounds interesting. Okay, tell me more. How much does it cost? The cost is $30,000. If I'm in the room, it's 40. Either they say yes or no, but you get an answer right there in that meeting. You talk them through your process. You talk them through how you do things. You have a, what I would call an entry level getting in the door project that allows you to build into a retainer. Because then you don't get ghosted, you're not spending your time writing proposals, you're not giving away any ideas or expertise for free, and you actually sign a client in that very first meeting. Now they will say, you know, send me something, you know, put this on paper, send me a contract, whatever it happens to be, but you have that all templated. You can go in and fill the customized information in and send it off, it takes you 15 minutes instead of four hours or 10 hours, or 20 hours, or however long you're spending on proposals. <clears throat> Talked about all that. So what this really is doing is allowing you to get paid for your ideas. It's allowing you to get paid for your expertise. How many of you have sat with a prospect, put together a proposal, said this is what we'll do based on what you learned, 
they sign the agreement, you get in there, you start working, and you realize they didn't tell you everything, they might have lied to you, you're missing information. So now what you put in the proposal or the scope of work at the beginning of the relationship doesn't apply because you were missing all this other information up front and you have to do all these other things first. But the problem is, is they're keeping you accountable to this, to the scope of work or your proposal that you did at the very, very beginning, but it's no longer working. So then we over-service. We do things that we need to do because we have to do it, but we're not getting paid for it. And then we create this cycle all over again. Stop doing that. We all do it. Everybody in here is nodding their heads. I'm, I'm still guilty of it sometimes. Oh yeah, we can do that. That's easy. Yeah, stop doing that. You really, really, the whole point here is so that you have FU money. I had a managing uh, director who worked in my agency many years ago, and I remember her saying to me, we need to have FU money. And I was like, what? She's like, we need to have enough money that when a prospect comes to us and we know they're not the right client for us, or we have a really terrible client that we need to be able to fire, we have enough money or addition, another, other revenue streams that we can go, peace out. Or we can, we can fire a client because they're not the right fit. I had one situation once where I, I, did, where I was doing a two-day strategy session, and it was in Chicago, so I was by myself. I wasn't with my team. And um, about two hours in, the CEO <laughs> says to me, I need to speak with you outside. I live in Chicago. It was January. He didn't let me get my coat. So I'm standing outside like this, and he is reading me the riot act. And he, what, it came, what I'd come to find out later is that he didn't want his team to hear like all the financial information that I was asking for in that meeting. In my defense, I did tell him I was going to ask for it, but uh, he used every curse word in the book. He F you this and F you that, and I said to him, hear you. I'm sorry. I went upstairs. I got my checkbook out. I wrote the $30,000 check back to him. I handed it to him and I walked out. So it allows you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I did. And I drink it from the bottle. <laughs> but it allows you to make those kinds of decisions. Now, even if I hadn't had a few money at that point, I probably still would have done that because he was terrible. But it allows you and having these opportunities of other types of revenue allow you to be able to do those kinds of things. It allows you to sit in a meeting with a prospect and go, too many red flags. You're not going to be worth my time later. And it's really hard to do because we all want to work with everybody who thinks we're going to be great. We all do, all of us. We all tend to be people pleasers. That's why we're in the agency client service business. But it does not allow us to do the kinds of work that we can and should be doing. And every single one of us knows that the wrong prospect that we sign on as a client will be a huge pain in the tush six months from now. We all know that. So a, a client of ours went on maternity leave, um, let me think about this, three years ago. And <laughs> she's literally in labor. And like, a client keeps calling her. And so like in between, she picks up her phone and she says to the guy, like, I'm having a baby right now. And he's like, okay, but I just need. And she's like, no, I'm, I'm having a baby right now and, and hung up on him. And he just hounded her and hounded her and hounded her to, to do, through her leave. It was, it was pretty bad. He was pretty bad. Um, and he was asking for like things that didn't, that weren't an emergency, that didn't, she didn't need to be interrupted. And she also had a team who was helping him that he refused to go to. So she came back from the leave and she said to me, I hear you, I need to create additional revenue streams, where do we start? And so we started, she actually created a social media 101, 101 program and sold the crap out of it to her existing clients, except him, and then she was able to tell him, peace out, all right? So that's what this allows you to do. She was able to use her FU money. <clears throat> So your action item is really to think about building packages as your entry level projects or programs. You should have something at the $20,000 mark, $40,000 mark, and $60,000 mark. It can be you know, a half day strategy session. It could be 
figuring, helping a client figure out how to set up goals in their Google Analytics. It could be SEO basics. It could be taking content that you've already, that they've already created and repurposing it. Whatever your expertise is, figure out what those projects are. Because that's going to be extraordinarily easy for you to say to a client or to a prospect, this is our process. This is what, these are the opportunities that we have. And they can choose right then and there. Yes, I want to work with you, and this is the one I want. It also allows you to have it on your website where prospects can clearly see, A, I can afford them or not, and then you don't hear from the ones that don't. So now you're attracting only the right clients, only the right prospects who have money to spend. It allows them to pay, buy online. If you take credit cards, I don't suggest you take a credit card for 60 grand, but you can take payments and have it recur. Taking credit cards, by the way, is one of the best things that you can do in your business, and I understand there are credit card processing fees. We'll loop that into how much your, your packages cost because it recurs every month. You don't have to chase money. You're never having to say, I haven't been paid in 120 days, and I know that there are light, great, big, huge corporations that don't, that will say we don't pay for 120 days, there are ways to get around that, especially at the beginning of a relationship. Have the balls to say to somebody, this is how we work, this is how we, this is what our process is, I can take a payment for five grand right now. Yes, ma'am. I just have to say that is so true because I had a startup client who wanted a bunch of work from me and knew that they had a horrible payment process and he said, can you just charge me whatever you would charge me plus 5% so I can pay you with a credit card so every time you do something, I can just charge it. And I made a ton of money from them because other people were like, oh, no, you don't want to take credit cards. Credit cards are amazing. Also, ACH wire. Doesn't cost as much money either. But it allows you, <laughs> in fact, we have, somebody just asked me this question, and I said, uh, we have, everybody either pays by credit card or wire except one client. He's one of my favorite clients. He's 77 years old, and he hands delivers me a check every month. <laughs> so I allow that. I'm like, all right, I'll go to the bank for you. But really, from that perspective, this is our process. This is how we work. This is how much it costs. Here's the link to pay. All right. So forget about Grant Cache. Build your additional revenue streams. Really stop relying on referrals and word of mouth. So that's our quick recap. Now, here we are. You don't have to do more content. Content marketing does not a sale make. We all work on the ROI issue. We all try to figure out all the results of all of this. It does not make a sale if you're not strategic and smart about it. If you're sticking everything up there, blogs, podcasts, eBooks, webinars, everything that you can think of, live streaming, videos, and you're not strategic about it, it will not help you make sales. It will help you build brand cachet for sure. It will help you with thought leadership and awareness. It will not help with sales. The other problem is, is you start to build all of this because you have the spaghetti approach and you are all over the place, people start to assume you're too busy and you have the pretty girl syndrome. It's the, oh, she's the most popular girl in class, somebody's already asked her to the prom, and nobody's asked her to the prom because everybody assumes she's already been asked. So you have to really think about what is it that's going to drive the most business for us, and that's where we should focus. <clears throat> All right, so I say this in a little bit of jest because I am the queen of content. If I could spend all of my time on content, I would. I love to create content. I have a book, I have two books, I've done international speaking, I have first page search results. If you Google certain things, like the peso model, first page, like, I mean, we, SEO, we've done, we have a paid membership community, of course, we have a big social media presence, we have lots and lots of video, we have a podcast, we have lower end products, we have higher end products, we have multiple online courses, we have partnerships with industry organizations. Okay, show me the money. It doesn't work. We're all over the freaking place. But that is not what makes a sale. It's not what brings the return on investment. You don't need to do all of the things. You have to do social media advertising. You have to have a really compelling landing page. 
You have to have one great piece of content, and I will tell you for this process, we have a webinar. It's automated, it's amazing, I don't have to show up all the time. You have to have a strong call to action in that piece of content, and you will drive new clients. That's all you need. If you focus on this process right here, and your one great piece of content is a webinar or a downloadable ebook, but there's a really strong call to action in there, and that strong call to action might be book a coaching call, or schedule a 15-minute chat, or whatever it happens to be, you will close clients left and right. That's all you need. So figure out your one piece of content, build that funnel I just showed you. You'll all get a copy of these slides too if you didn't get it. Create, make sure you have that really strong call to action. Talk to prospects, meet with them, have conversations with them, video chat, in person, whatever it happens to be, and get a yes or no verbal response. Every time. No more writing proposals, no more relying on referrals or word of mouth, no more relying on, oh, I have to build more brand cachet. You don't have to do any of that. And then the last thing you really want to think about is invest in coaching. And Tim Washer and I just had this conversation at the chatter as well. The biggest thing about coaching is you may very well know what to do, but you're not being held accountable. We all need to be held accountable, all of us. Every single one of us needs to be held accountable. Everyone should have a coach. Hopefully you have more ideas now than you did 30, 45 minutes ago. The problem is, is our beliefs and ideas are solely on us, especially because we're business owners. We're supposed to be the experts. We're supposed to be the smartest people in the room. And so we need to have somebody that we can trust, that isn't going to judge us, and that allows us to have accountability. So your belief in your mindset about what's possible, and hopefully I've changed a little bit about that today, drives the quality of your ideas, right? If you think you have to write proposals, you have to write proposals. Then it, that leads to your actions, so what you actually do, which leads to your outcomes. That means your income, your happiness, your lifestyle, whatever, working less hours, Sharon, whatever it happens to be, right? If you can do, if you can change your mindset and your action, that will change your outcome. So think about these things that I've told you today. If you're not happy and you're not achieving the results that you want in your agency, you need a coach. If you want to hit the next level, you need a coach. Doctors earn $189,000 a year with 14 years of schooling. My friend Erin, who I mentioned that made $2,000 when we were going up with the lift, she's doing about $20,000 a month in passive income. She's making more than a doctor does, and she went to school for four years. She's making more money in one year than a doctor does after 14 years of schooling. My cycling coach is paid to beat the crap out of me. In fact, somebody said, hey, why don't you do a podcast of you and your coach? And I was like, it will be, all you'll hear is curse words, I hate yous, and why are you doing this to me? It's not a very compelling podcast. But you will hear me swear, because I do. But he, I pay him to beat the crap out of me, because A, he beats the crap out of me, B, he makes me th do things I wouldn't do on my own, and C, I can actually compete with the big boys, which kinda, I kind of love. And then when my kid's behind me on, uh, on the, in the baby seat behind me, and she'll go, catch up with that green car. I can catch up with the green car, because my, I pay my coach to beat the crap out of me. Don't go it alone. Invest in yourself. If that's one of, and you're, you've invested in yourselves by being here, which is great, continue to do that. Make sure that you're focusing on the kinds of things that will allow you to grow and reach your goals without hope as a strategy, without referrals and word of mouth. So that's your action item. Really think about how you're going to invest in yourself. Even Michael Jordan. I would say one of the best play ball players because now we have LeBron James. I don't know if I can mention him in Cleveland. Are we still on the love-hate? Okay, because he left again, so I don't know if we, can, we, we hate him again. Um, everybody has a coach. Some of the, the, very, the most successful people have coaches. Don't go it alone. So <clears throat> today, I promise, whew, close as many clients as you need, fill your pipeline with qualified referrals, create lucrative, lucrative revenue streams, attract only the right clients, get off the hamster wheel, 
and get over the what have I done for you, what have you done for me lately mentality. To do those things, you need to forget about brand cachet, create additional revenue streams, one per year for the next seven years until you have seven or eight of them. Stop relying on referrals and word of mouth. Focus on one piece of content and build that funnel I showed you. Invest in coaching. If you do that, you will have a completely different business a year from now. Do we have time for questions? I ran so fast. <laughs> oh, yeah? One or two? Yeah? Oh, yes, ma'am. Webinar versus ebook. Yeah, and how uh, the link is used. Um, super good question. We've tested both, and the webinar tends to work better because I think most people are visual. Um, so we offer, we do offer both, and actually the the ebook is the transcript of the webinar that we've just created a an ebook out of and made pretty. Um, it's not as effective from a conversions perspective because people download it and they don't read it. But when they're required to sit on a webinar, they actually show up and, yeah. So, and it's easier for you because you can automate all of that. One more. Yes, sir. Yes. So creating additional revenue streams with affiliates or having advertising sponsors. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the, to, that is the traditional way of doing it. And if you can do it, hands down, yes, because it's all passive, it's all automated. Absolutely, I would think about that. Uh, Chris has a podcast that they do sponsorships on. They make a nice little amount of money on that. You know, absolutely, I would think about those kinds of things as well, for sure. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> We're running out of time, sorry. I have a question about the, um, you said entry level get the door problem. Yep. So the entry level projects, um, so like a two day strategy session is one. Or um, I think one of the things you guys do is like showing people how to set up goals and analytics. Or simple assessments, simple assessments and audits, a brand audit. Um, we have a client who does a brand Bible and it's a $40,000 project. So those kinds of things that allow you to do quick, really quick work. I personally like the strategy session because then there's no missing information, you know. It, you get you get all of the information you need in that meeting, and you it allows you to um, build relationships at the at the highest C level because they're in those meetings with you, and it it turns into very lucrative work later. We have people coming in for the next session. We'll go really fast. Yes. Is there a minimal uh, level that you would say you should start with your clients? Level? Minimum. To Yeah, I don't think there's a minimum. I mean, I don't think $100 is too low. I will tell you that as you start to build bigger and bigger, more expensive things, the $100 projects are going to be death by paper cut. <laughs> but it's a good place to start and get your feet wet and beta test it all. You're welcome.